My name's Tom Allen. I'm one of the professors in the School of Law here in Durham. If you know your accents, you'll know I wasn't born and raised in Durham, but it's my home now. So I wanted to talk about one of our local heroes, Granville Sharp. Sharp was born in 1753 here in Durham. He came from a family associated with the church. His father was uh, working in the cathedral at Durham and they lived in one of the houses that was on the precincts, the territory of, of the cathedral. So he was born here, he went to school here up until the age of 15. He was in Durham school here in Durham. When he was 15, he had to leave school. Basically, the family ran out of money. They couldn't afford, a lot of children couldn't afford to send all of them to school. So at that point, he heads down to London, to, I guess, to make his name or find work or whatever he was going to do. And he eventually winds up as a civil servant working in London. So at that point, it doesn't look like he's going to have the most exciting life. It doesn't look like the kind of person we're going to be talking about hundreds of years later. We might not be speaking about Granville Sharp today if it hadn't been for Jonathan Strong. So Jonathan Strong was a, an African enslaved by David Lyle, who was a slave owner who happened to be in London. And one day, he beat Jonathan Strong so badly, he was thrown out in the street, basically left to die. So Jonathan Strong has heard of William Strong, Granville's brother, because he's a doctor in London and he will sometimes take care of people who can't afford a doctor. So Jonathan Strong goes to his medical practice. Uh, William takes him in and tells his brother, Granville, about what has happened. So Granville and William decide that they're going to help Jonathan Strong recover. Uh, and that is what they do. So I, again, we still don't know what it is that, we get an idea of what Granville and William are like, but we don't know yet what it is that's going to make him so well known. But what happens next is one day, a couple of years after this, uh, this f former slave owner, the person who owned or, or claimed to own Jonathan Strong, spots him in the street in London and decides he's going to reclaim him. Uh, and in fact, he actually sells him to another person, James Kerr, and they try to capture Jonathan Strong and take him back to Jamaica. Uh, so this wasn't all that unusual. This kind of thing was going on in London and in England at the time. We had slaves and former slaves being captured and transported to the plantations in the Caribbean. Uh, in that respect, it wasn't that unusual. However, Granville Sharp decides he's going to fight this um, on behalf of Jonathan Strong. They bring a case to a magistrate who happened to be the Lord Mayor of London, arguing that there's no basis for him to be held against his will, no basis in law. And the Lord Mayor agrees, and so he's released. Again, you might have thought the story would stop here. You know, the, it's a nice story for Jonathan Strong, we hope, although he was so badly injured, he didn't live for much longer after this. Um, but then what happens is Lyle and James Kerr decide they're going to bring a case against Granville Sharp for interfering with what they regard as their property. And Granville Sharp, being the kind of person he is, decides to fight. Um, and he wins his case. But not only does he win his case, but what is so important for a sort of subsequent history is he, he's absolutely convinced that morally he's in the right. He has no doubt about that. But he then researches all the old legal texts and he decides that he's legally in the right as well. So that there is no basis for slavery in England. You have no legal claim that the court should recognize in England. Well, Granville Sharp is not actually a lawyer himself but he's read through all the legal texts and he's come to this conclusion. He then publishes what they used to call a tract, a book, outlining all of his legal research and all of his legal arguments. And he begins to talk to people in the legal profession and he begins to look for a test case so that he can fight what's happened and get it decided by the courts, by the higher courts, to acknowledge his arguments. Eventually that happens in the case of Somerset v. Stewart. It's decided that the law of England does not support a claim to holding a slave in England. It's a, it's a fairly narrow ruling in the end. Basically, it says you cannot take 
someone against their will and transport them outside of England on the basis that they're a slave. That legal argument doesn't stand up. Somerset v. Stewart is one of the most famous cases in English legal history. And a lot of the arguments, a lot of the background work was done by Granville Sharp. So for that alone, he deserves to be remembered. Going further, however, he also ends up um, being one of the driving forces behind the case around the Zong Massacre. Uh, he gets to be very involved with the creation of the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. And he works tirelessly, almost relentlessly, trying to build up a couple of public campaign against the slave trade and trying to bring about changes in Parliament to do this. Now he dies in 1813, so he lives long enough to see Parliament pass laws to abolish the slave trade. Um, so that must have felt like a great success to him, although he's getting to be quite old by that point. Uh, he doesn't live long enough to see the abolition of slavery. That was not for another 20 years or so after his death. But nevertheless, he's remembered now because of his persistence and because of the success, ultimately, of the abolition of the slave trade. But he's also interesting because reading through his history, you realize what a long and difficult struggle it is. There are the people we remember, like Granville Sharp and many of his associates. There are others like Oledao Equino, who was a former slave who passed information on to Sharp and others and worked with them to try to bring about the end of the slave trade and slavery. And then there are other people like Jonathan Strong, who is known for his connection with the first legal cases and for being, in a sense, the inspiration or the reason why Granville Sharp pips this up. But we know very little bit about him. Um, and, we, and there are many other countless people we don't know. So Sharp is sort of, for me, a bit of an emblem of what the case against slavery was. Ultimately, the campaign that he supported was successful. Sometimes I ask myself, what kind of person was he? Portraits that I've looked at suggest he was kind of a severe person. I mean, I don't know if he was or not, but that's, that's the impression you get from the portraits. Uh, he was clearly, like many lawyers, um, someone who loved the written text. He used the text, the ancient sort of law documents and everything else, to put together a case to fight against it. But it wasn't just that. He's also known, um, apparently, as, a, as an expert on grammar. So he obviously loved picking apart phrases and figuring out exactly what was meant, and that's what kind of drove him along. He, you know, in a sense, a natural lawyer, even though he wasn't a qualified lawyer. Um, so he, he, to me, he looks like a severe person, but there are also portraits of him with his entire family. They used to have, a, a, I think, a barge that they kept on the River Thames, and they would all gather and play music together. So I was happy to hear about that, because it made him seem a little bit more human to me than somebody who was always buried with his nose in a book. So one of the things about the story of Granville Sharp that I think about is this, that often when we look at conditions in the past, especially horrifying conditions like the slave trade, the way Jonathan Strong was treated, all those kind of things, sometimes we start making apologies. Uh, we start saying things like, oh, things were different back then. You have to understand what the morality was like back then. People were, were different at that point. They didn't know. Um, I think two things. First of all, well, which people are you talking about? Because certainly the slaves and the former slaves, they knew. But also someone like Granville Sharp. I mean, he was, he was a white man moving in a sort of a middle-class English society. If that's the place where somebody might say, well, everybody thought slavery was, was fine. Well, not everybody. There was Granville Sharp and others like him who, although they must have felt that their cause was a difficult one and it was hard to win people over, they just didn't accept the conventional wisdom and they pushed and pushed and pushed for change. And that's why change came. So for me, that's part of the lesson of Granville Sharp. We have to be careful when we start making excuses or apologies for the atrocities of the past.